Hey guys, welcome to this video. I want to go over another case decision here, and this involves Portfolio Recoveries, James Navarro. And you can see it's from September of 2019. This is a case brought under the FDCPA against this debt collector, very famous or infamous debt collector, Portfolio Recovery. And we're going to see what happens here in the summary judgment. So we've got a summary judgment filed by the plaintiff against the defendant saying, hey judge, rule in our favor. And the defendant has filed a summary judgment against the plaintiff saying, rule in our favor. And the judge doesn't keep us in suspense here. He says, I'm granting the defendant's motion, denying the plaintiff's motion. So it's a pretty simple case. It's one single violation of the FDCPA, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. And here's the deal. In 2017, the plaintiff pulls his credit reports. He sees that Portfolio Recovery was reporting a delinquent account. And so he sent a letter, or a letter was sent on his behalf. We'll talk about that later. But December 6, defendant received this letter saying the account's disputed. Now, on the 27th, the defendant then sent a message to the credit bureaus with an XB compliance code. So what does that mean? Well, judge tells us that means that that is the code for the account is in dispute. And then the defendant again reported it on the 8th. So uh, portfolio, at least in this case, the evidence is they report twice a month. So the 8th and the 27th. Now, on January 11th, portfolio says, hey, we have finished our investigation and we find this is a valid account. And so they attach some statements and the court notes that nothing indicates whether the plaintiff followed up with the defendant or continued to dispute the debt. Now I'll say this, under the FDCPA, you can dispute one time. And the collector can say, see, here's our proof. It doesn't matter. It still is a disputed debt. You'll see the whole core of this case is, did Portfolio Recovery report the account as being disputed? And so I don't think the judge is trying to suggest that you have to uh, dispute things multiple times. But I just want to make that clear. One time is enough. And then after it finished its investigation, portfolio starts submitting this XC code. Well, what is that? So XC, according to the judge, informs the reporting agencies that the data furnisher, that's portfolio because they furnish information. So here's portfolio, here's the credit bureau, they furnish information up to the credit bureau. So it says they've completed their investigation, but the consumer disagrees. And then they continue to submit that twice a month, remember the 8th and the 27th, until a lawsuit was filed. Now the court points this out, and this is sort of unfortunate timing for the plaintiff. Three weeks before filing suit, plaintiff entered into a payment plan with defendant. So this was, a, I think, a Capital One credit card. Portfolio says, hey, we now own it. The plaintiff disputes it. Portfolio says, yeah, you owe this debt. And then the plaintiff starts you know, enters into a payment agreement with them. And then pulled his credit report three days later, discovered Experian was still reporting the outstanding past due debt. And then the day the lawsuit was filed, he made his first payment. Now, here, here's what's unclear from this opinion. But let me just highlight this part. The Experian was still reporting plaintiff's outstanding past due debt with defendant. Well, when you dispute directly to a debt collector, they can continue to still report that the debt is outstanding and that you owe it. They just have to report it as being disputed. Now, if it turns out you really don't owe the account, well, that's a separate matter. Okay, but we're just talking about this dispute status under Section 1692E8. So I'm not sure exactly what the court means there. But this next part of the opinion talks about summary judgment. There's basically two parts to summary judgment, and that's where you're asking the court, we don't need a trial, just go ahead and summarily enter judgment in my favor. Number one, there's no genuine issue or genuine dispute as to any material fact. So material fact is an important fact, a fact that could make a difference. 
And then number two, after viewing the evidence most favorably to the non-moving party. So in this uh, opinion, we're going to focus on the defendant trying to get summary judgment against the plaintiff. So the plaintiff would be the non-moving party here. The defendant's entitled to prevail as a matter of law, even after you consider the evidence most favorably toward the plaintiff. So that's what has to happen here. So there's a little more law, which we'll skip. And then here we have the core of the case. Is if you remember from our videos where we go through each section of the FDCPA, section E is the section on misrepresentation or fraud. And so that's the false, deceptive, misleading representation or means in connection with the collection of a debt. And then E8 is specifically what we're talking about here. Communicating or threatening to communicate to any person credit information which is known or which should be known to be false, including the failure to communicate that a disputed debt is disputed. So that's really the case here. So plaintiff argues defendant violated this provision by failing to report to Experian the count was in dispute as of December 2017 when defendant received plaintiff's initial letter. Now, what's the response? Well, the response by portfolio is we did report the dispute and we investigated the account. We determined it's valid. We informed the plaintiff of the validity of the count and we report status of the investigation and the reporting agencies. Now, again, it's unclear from the opinion what exactly the plaintiff is saying because everything the defendant says there is fine. Yeah, but uh, truthfully, it doesn't really matter if the defendant told the credit bureaus this account is disputed, not just while they were investigating, but even after they investigated. In other words, if I dispute on January 1, well, when we roll around to December 31st, they still better mark my account as being disputed if I have truly disputed that. So we try to piece together what happened here from uh, what the court says. Plaintiff submit a copy of the July 2018 Experian credit report showing plaintiff's account has passed due. Again, that doesn't really matter. It's fine for portfolio to report it that way. The question is, did they report it as being disputed? Defendant argues, well, you can't consider that because it's hearsay. In other words, it's a statement made outside of court and it's unauthenticated. So nobody from Experian came in and said, yes, this is an official copy of your credit report. And let me just back up a second. When I say all that matters is portfolio showing is disputed. If you truly do not owe that debt or a portfolio truly doesn't own that debt or has no right to collect it, well, then there's more to it. But I'm just saying, based on what we have here, particularly the plaintiff making payment arrangements with portfolio recovery, paying portfolio recovery, kind of hard to argue when you're paying them that you truly don't owe the debt, but you can still dispute it. And so that's the question. Was it marked as disputed? And the court says, well, look, uh, we're really going to look more at substance over form. So uh, there may be evidence that is inadmissible in its present summary judgment form, but whose contents would nonetheless be admissible at trial. And then the court says, you know what? It doesn't matter. Okay. We get to the end of this sentence here. It says, even accepting the plaintiff could authenticate, establish hearsay exception for the Experian report at trial, plaintiff has still failed to raise a genuine dispute of material fact. Well, why is that, Judge? What, what, what's going on? He says, well, the defendant has submitted a declaration or an affidavit. And that says that they reported the dispute to the reporting agencies by submitting an XB code, the required and only mechanism signal a dispute. And then they submitted XC code signaling a conducted complete investigation to the disputed debt. Again, uh, I'm assuming that portfolio is still continuing to mark this account as being disputed. And so that's what they say happened. Okay, and they attach some internal records that show that they sent this dispute to Experian. And what does the plaintiff have? And, and this is key. This, this is not just the complaint here. This is 
they've gone through all discovery. So you take depositions, you can issue subpoenas, you can get documents here. So out of all that effort, what has the plaintiff come up with to contradict or cast doubt on portfolio recovery when they say, hey, we've sent the dispute notification to Experian? Judge says, only evidence is the Experian report, but that doesn't contradict the defendant's declaration. And then notice what the judge says here. That Experian may have failed to take corrective action on its end does not support the inference that defendant failed to report the dispute on its end. So here you go. you got Portfolio and you've got Experian. Portfolio sends the dispute notification to Experian. That, that's all they can do. I mean, they can't make Experian do anything. So as long as they report it, then they've complied with the law. Well, what would happen if they did that, but Experian said, we never got it? Or Experian said, yeah, we got it, but we didn't want to mark it as disputed. Well, that's not Portfolio's fault. That's Experian's fault here. So let's look at what the judge says here. Had plaintiff, for example, submitted evidence Experian did not receive the dispute, he may have created a dispute of material fact as whether defendant sent it. So remember, defendant's over here saying, I sent it to Experian. Well, if Experian said we never got it, now that's going to be a question of fact. Did portfolio send it or did they not send it? But the plaintiff didn't submit any of that evidence. Court will not read this into plaintiff's evidence without more. Defendants demonstrated it satisfied its duties and accordingly cannot be held liable for experienced possible deficiencies. We'll get that in a footnote, what the judge means there. Plaintiff has provided no evidence to controvert this, which is that it reported the disputed debt. Therefore, summary judgment is granted. Here's the somewhat surprising thing is... Defendant seeks its attorney's fees. Now, normally you only get attorney's fees if the lawsuit was brought in bad faith. Uh, and it requests cost, which you get cost if you're the winner. The cost are basically some out-of-pocket expenses. Okay, It's not attorney's fees. So you got to get attorney's fees by saying the consumer brought this in bad faith. The court says, I agree. I'm going to give you time to submit a fee petition here. And so actually order the plaintiff and the plaintiff's lawyers to pay portfolio recovery. So maybe we can get some idea of why the judge seems to be taking a bit of a harsh approach here. And we look at this first footnote. So remember this. The whole case is built on one dispute letter. One dispute letter sent to portfolio. And then the allegation is portfolio did not notify, apparently just Experian, you would think otherwise Equifax and TransUnion credit reports would be brought into this. But it's only Experian. So there's one critical letter. So that letter is the, the key bit of evidence here. Notice what the judge says. The plaintiff did not actually send the letter himself. Well, who sent it? The letter was signed James Navarro with permission. Plaintiff testified at his deposition he had never seen the letter prior to the deposition. That's shocking. Now, maybe he had. Sometimes clients say sort of crazy things at deposition. But if that's true, that the, the critical piece of the case here, the everything rests on this dispute letter going out and then portfolio not doing what it's supposed to do, and the client says, yeah, I never saw it until right now. Yeah, here, here it is right now. A deposition, he's going, oh, wow, so that's what I sent. So that's what this whole case is built on. He says his lawyer signed it. Again, I don't know if that's true. That's not what I would recommend doing. Certainly when lawyers come to me and say, hey, how do we do this? Now, now look, it, sometimes you may use a service to send out, you know, certified mail and things like that. But the client needs to see the letter. client needs to approve the letter and say, yes, send that. And it may be then the lawyer where the lawyer staff, you know, puts it in an envelope and puts the postage on it and mails it, that's fine. But for a client to be like, I never saw the letter until I'm raising my hand, swearing under oath, it's a little odd. And then this, 
Uh, footnote two, he says he opened an account with Capital One, didn't pay it off, never denied he owed the amount. And remember, before he filed a lawsuit, he agreed to pay portfolio. Again, not the best set of facts. And then this is that footnote four. So if you remember up here, it says, without more, defendants demonstrate it satisfies duties and accordingly cannot be held liable for experienced possible deficiencies. Well, what's he talking about? As the defendant of the Fair Credit Reporting Act supplies a cause of action against a credit reporting agency like Experian for failure to report a disputed account. So let's go back to here's portfolio. They notify Experian, hey, this account's in dispute. And let's say Experian gets that and Experian says, nah, we're not going to report that. Well, that's not portfolio's fault. That's Experian's fault. So you don't sue portfolio, you sue Experian. Now, you don't know this when you file the suit, but that's what discovery is for and things that we call initial disclosures. And so I'm pretty confident having litigated I don't know, dozens of cases against portfolio recovery. I mean, when you sue them, it gets their attention. They're like, hey, here's our proof. Now, a lot of times they send us the proof and we know that they are accidentally leaving stuff out. OK, and we go. Yeah, that's cute. But you left out the critical documents here. But here, if they supply this and you look at it, you go, wow, it looks like they notified Experian. Hang on, portfolio. Let's go subpoena Experian, see if they received it. And then what did they do with it? Because if Experian received the dispute and did nothing with it, you got to let portfolio go. Remember, that's the whole case is I disputed the portfolio and they didn't report it to the credit bureaus as being disputed. Well, if they did, you have no case against portfolio your case would be against Experian here. So anyway, I hope that you found that helpful. This is you know something I want to try and do maybe once a week, uh, once every other week, or whenever I find interesting cases, because I think it helps to illustrate in the real world how these cases come about. It's nice, I see people talking on videos or articles, or people will contact me and say, well, well so-and-so said this is what would happen in a lawsuit. And just the way they say it, I'm like, okay, this person has never been in a lawsuit or they've been in one lawsuit, you know, and they think, oh, well, what happened there is what happens all. No, you know, to be in one lawsuit does not make you an expert on lawsuits. You need to be in dozens and dozens and dozens of lawsuits across a wide range of types of cases and localities to be able to get a feel for what's truly going on out there. So these are real judges. These are real parties. I mean, it's all public record here. So we got James Navarro, uh, Credit Pair Lawyers of America, Portfolio Recovery, Bradley Lynn Dunn. Uh, you, you know, this is the, these are all real people here, and this is what a real federal court judge appointed for life ruled. So anyway, I hope you find that helpful. And uh, if you have any cases you want me to look at. Just paste in the either the full site or the Google Scholar link, and I'll add that to our list. Okay, you guys have a great one. Bye-bye.